Welcome to the to Art of the Kent. Um, we are really, really thrilled um, that not only are we do we have this great exhibition that is filling all of the rooms of this place, 18 galleries, 17 artists throughout this entire complex. And we had quite a crowd yesterday of approximately 500 people here for the opening. So perhaps you were here to see the chaos. Uh, <clears throat> not the right time to see the show. So we're, we're particularly thrilled to be collaborating with Delia Robinson. Uh, our showcase, <laughs> our showcase uh, artist down in the general store of the Kent, where she has all of her paintings, her whistles, and a cranky. Um, and those are on display throughout the entire month as well. Uh, but tonight we also have the revered and former Kent's Corner uh, balladeer, Norman Kennedy. <laughs> We are very thrilled to bring Norman back home to Kent's Corner, where he belongs. And uh, I'm going to turn it over at this point to your cranky mistress, Delia Robinson. Years and years and years ago, my sister Nona told me about an experience that she had had that I found so intriguing that I decided I would try to replicate it. And that required a little research. But I found out that the places I needed to go were everywhere in the whole wide world. Here is one, and this is where I had my experience. And that was I had friends that lived in Colorado when I was visiting them, and they took me to this cold river. But right here is a hot spring, and you can't go in high water, it's, all, it's covered up. But if you go in the right lowness, you can go into that river and stand up to the water, neck deep. And if you go to a certain place, the half of your body will be hot, <laughs> roasty toasty hot, and the other half really icy cold. <laughs> And this divided sensation, I don't know who did this, it's on the, online, it looks like some teenager with really dramatic thoughts, but I really <laughs> like that hand there, and also I like the dividing. This is a, it's this divided sensation of the river, and that feeling, and this sort of thing feels like it's the right metaphor for this ballad that we're celebrating tonight. The ballad is Benori, if you're Norman, and the two sisters, if you're me, or Bow and Ballads, or Oh the Dreadful Wind and the Rain. And those are the most common names in our area, but it has many, many more names than that. It's a story of two sisters, one dark and one light, who fall in love with the same man. And the younger sister wins the man's heart, and that so enrages the older one that she bumps her into the river and drowns her. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> but later, we'll get to that. But like many old ballads, it not only has many names, it has many, many versions. 500 versions have been collected according to one index of, of folk music. And uh, those have been collected across Europe and America. And then the best versions, like Norman's, you can sense these two worlds, the hot world, the cold world. It's as if one steps into that heated water that's flowing in the cold river. And the, the reason that happens is this perplexing ancient world view that runs side by side in the more acceptable ordinary story. And that is love gone wrong. But tucked in with the commonplace, there are these old sort of subterranean reverberations that for some reason haven't been suppressed as they are in most old songs. So, the dualities. Can one really make a case that a simple story suggests this tussle between the remnants of our old ancestral belief systems? And those were people who 
our ancestors went into caves down into the earth to paint and commune with their deities in caves. And what took over eventually, slowly over much time, were these people who looked to the sky for their, for their moral advice, mm -hmm. and who they supplanted the people who, who were the earthy ones. And they are the inspiration for our dominant moral belief system today. And so I'm not going to say more about that. You can think about it all you want, but it's a mystifying business. And the, do the ballad characters personify a war between dark and light? Can they do that? The hot and cold and the traditional and the non-traditional. I think it's just a ballad, but under the surface it has a lot to say. And it's said to be the longest continually, continuously sung ballad in Europe and America in, or in the Western world. And it says maybe more than I have ever before acknowledged, and I think that's why it's stuck around so long. There's something that goes on with this ballad that is a little bit tricky. Okay, so in 1851, this Scottish painter, uh, John Fayed, was inspired to paint his take on this ballad. He called it The Cruel Sister, which is yet another name. And it was at a time when painting sh shiny fabric was really admired, and so that dress is ever so shiny. And the sisters kind of are reduced to arm candy for the main event. That's the man, even though the, he's very mo he's not. He, but here he's center stage. He's got legs like a tree trunk, and look at that hat. There's no tartan there. I don't know what he thinks, but, but there he is. And so in discussing this painting, a critic observed that the man is pointing to his dog, and a dog is a symbol for faithfulness. And that's how he's winning this girl, there, is by the, that he's faithful. I have some doubts about that. But um, <laughs> anyway, with his left hand, he holds the hand of the younger sister, and she's got her head modestly down. And all this has seriously ticked off the older <laughs> sister, right? And the critic also observes that the, lever, the lovers are in step with each other, and she's out of step. So clearly, he thinks he's given us the whole story there. That's all he had to say. This love triangle and a little bit of, you can't see it here because the slide isn't clean enough, but distant, distant water back there to say there's some water going on in this ballad. And this glowering sky. And for the critic, it seemed like simple jealousy over a man was the whole topic. Okay? And I'm pleased to observe that the painter didn't listen all that attentively to the song's words because he used the wrong tube of paint here. The song repeatedly says that girl has yellow hair. Yellow. <laughs> yeah. And that's part of the dark and light mis magic in this. And uh, so he's done that. Okay, so we all know that blondes have more fun. And it's in ballads, that's one an annoying long held convention. I don't know how long, but it certainly has dominated our lives. It must have been from an ad. Anyway, there's Clara, another long uh, held convention that blondes are inherently good. Oh, here's having more fun. But blondes are, are inherently good in these ballads. And one scholar complained, it would be refreshing to find a ballad in which the bad character was the blonde one. And that really is of interest because many, many ballads, the, the, the villain is the dark-haired one. In the old days, and I hope not now, Fair skin was considered prettier, and they're as pretty as they could be. But the peaches and cream girl was always good, and the rotten reputation is left for the darker person. And this pernicious concept is more understandable when you consider that these are northern ballads, and the northern environment where this ballad flourished and still sung probably influenced that kind of thinking. Um, so excuse me now, because I'm going to do a lightning dash across the most confusing history I've ever encountered, and that's of the Nordic lands. Mm, oh. yeah. <laughs> and when, uh, so I'm going to reduce it down to practically silliness. When the fair-haired Nordics came to raid and to settle at the end of the 8th century in Scotland, they already <coughs> feared dark people as foreign or other. The potential enemy were these dark people, and they the Nordics swarmed ashore, and then they stayed, and they pushed back on the various small, fierce, dark, indigenous, tattooed people who were already there. And some of them, like the Picts, were all blue with woad, some sort of thing. And so um, those, here were these people being pushed, pushed aside by big, blonde people. And uh, they were great stone carvers. Here's a carving of portraits of themselves. It's hard to see, but they're sort of dressed in these little 
fetching frocks, and they were great stone carvers. And uh, is there another one? Yeah, the next? No. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you can see this. These people sort of put their butts, their butts on other guy's nose, and I think this was a pictish joke. Because if you look at it for a while, you think, well, there's no way you can look at that and not think, what were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> They're making fun of somebody. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway. Uh, these, they were great stone carvers, and when metal came in, they became great metal workers. The indigenous people objected to big, blonde, Next one, yeah, this big, here's the Norse guy. He's shaking hands with the, the indigenous ruler who's going, oh my gosh. And, but the Norse, they didn't like these people settling on their land, but in no time, they were all intermingled with the invaders. And somewhat in that process, the ballad of the two sisters of the Nori was shared with the Scots. And so were some very interesting belief systems that got shared. And like the Viking idea that the soul resides in the bones, and that is really important in this ballad, to think that the soul resides in the bones. And we'll get to that later, but it's very important. And they also shared a fair amount of Nordic DNA with the indigenous people. Because if you have Scots, if you're part Scots blood, you, and you get the DNA tests now that are quite cheap, you'll be told how, that you have a ton of Scandinavian blood, even though as far as you knew, there was never a Scandinavian in your entire family line. And with that comes Neanderthal blood. So here we are, Norman. I'm okay. living proof. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in northern ballads originating in Scandinavia, like this, the dark, dark coloring was scorned and often very crudely and rudely scorned. Dark was a code for lower social caste. Mm -hmm. Tan skin suggested you had the status of a field hand, and that wasn't considered a great thing. In the two sisters, or Benori, the darker sister berates the good girl, the blonde girl, for destroying her chances at matrimony. She says, your rosy cheeks and your golden hair leave me a maiden forevermore, mm -hmm. maiden being unmarried. Mm -hmm. And as for the hair, some painters got it right, we're gonna have a quick gloss over. This is Catherine Cameron, she was a very well-respected uh, Glasgow painter, she was a member of the Glasgow Society of Ladies Artists, mm -hmm. and uh, and this is one of her, oh, and here's someone who neglected it all together. Like, yeah, come back. This is modern, um, internet book. And I don't know what they were thinking, but they, they gave them lots of hair, and it's black, black, black. So they apparently weren't interested in that kind of discrepancy either. Okay, so while looking at Benori art, one sees that this ballad has inspired some of the most unusually sentimental paintings ever made. Of <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it, it, they're, they're better paintings. The better paintings are all about Ophelia, not about our girl. But the idea is the same. And here's a modern one. So they're all languid. They have, I guess that's dead, but it, they are all drooping around in water. And the, some of them, it, for me, this topic is both dismaying and frightening. But how artists handle it is interesting. Here's one by the woman Lorena, Lorena McKenna, the Canadian folk singer who sings this ballad in a very dramatic way. And she painted this painting. And this is, you have an energetic drowner here. She's really doing her best to get out next. Um, there she is up close. She really, she really, that's a different girl than the, than the limp ones we were just looking at. But anyhow, uh, she's trying to save herself. And then here's one that's found everywhere online, is given no attribution at all, but she seems to be taking a nap in the weeds. <laughs> and, and I kind of like that, that napping, that napping dead girl. So, <laughs> we have um, a, one a bit more submerged. That, there, that is tiny bit in real life, that's oh, in the yeah. tape, that's an enormous picture, enormous. And the poor uh, model was Elizabeth, what's her name, Sidel? And she was a pre-Raphaelite muse, and she had to lie in ice water in the winter, and she got very sick, pneumonia or very bad cold. And her father was really angry that they made her pose like that. But that was done for Ophelia. But I thought that was a good picture. We're getting further under the water, and that's good. All right, so others want the total underwater look. This is from some children's book, I guess. And you can't even tell what that is. There's a small nub of a person there, but the rest is underwater. 
And uh, I went for that look in the cranky, too. You don't have to paint a body that way. You just squish them. <laughs> 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 and then, Where did that come from? Off the that, internet with no attribution. Oh, really? Yeah, it looks very familiar to me. But I can't think. Yeah, I think it was a children's book. Like, a, like what does it say down below there? That's that just is. tells. Oh, this I can't read, but yeah. this it just tells the the, the, the part. First she sank, and then she and then she swam. Part of the that ballad. Mean, it gives a name. And anyhow, so um, that one more it shows a total float look. You don't aren't in the water all you're just going along like a steamboat down there. <laughs> I kind of like that chance of Ophelia flowers and all that. But this is for a, a book about that murder ballads by Katie Horan, and I think it's also an internet kind of creation. Uh, and the last image about this is this teeny little one. This is a quilt, also by a nameless maker. But it's seriously inspiring to me. I love the little little tiny person there, and that's what this bear is doing, but yeah, and she looks mighty pleased if you can see her. She's like, oh boy, I took care of her. <laughs> so, the great ballad collector and scholar Francis James Child collected 21 versions and he traced the tragic story of the two sisters from its Scandinavian roots up to the first printing of it in a broadside in 1656. And here's the one that Rick asked me about who, in another show, who, who drew this? And I said, Roland Thomason, but it's not true. It's Thomas Rowlandson. And <laughs> <laughs> I was so embarrassed I almost fell through the floor. But he was from the mid 1700s to the mid 1800s, and oh, I love that picture. But it shows a ballad, it's called The Ballad Singer, and it shows a ballad singer making money on the street singing ballads, but over her arm she has newsprint, kind of very cheaply printed up ballads that she'll oh. sell to anyone who wants to buy one. And these broadsides brought many early ballads forward to be printed, and murder and catastrophe were, of course, the preferred topics. But often, in the process, they were given to kind of hack poets, and they fancied up the language just incredibly and made it kind of embarrassingly ornate. And they also often relieved ballads of any supernatural or pagan concepts. And um, there's another ballad singer. I love this one. I, I think she's holding a baby. I can't quite tell. But uh, it, it, these cheaply printed versions were really cheap. And uh, they, it was a, the oral tradition for learning ballads was slowly being replaced by the printed word. Mm. And that's an interesting time. And that started in the, about the 1400s and went on for, for quite a while. In fact, we can still buy sheet music, so it's still going. Okay, I'll spare you a very long list of northern countries, but Professor Child, here he is, he stepped in. Uh, he stated the same story, that this, this story of this ballad originated in Norway and it spread everywhere with versions that reflected all the, from Iceland all the way to Slovenia and, and all the countries in between have versions of this ballad. As a teenager, I learned this song is Bow and Balance. It's a refrain from a contra dance step, and I couldn't see how that had anything to do with this grim ballad, and I must not. But the variant, that variant is said to be distinctly American. And Cecil Sharp, here he is, collecting with his pal Maud. Uh, he went all over Appalachia under really desperate conditions, no roads, they hiked all over collecting ballads. And he found 14 versions of this in southern Appalachia. And uh, they had numerous endings. A lot of them just focused on the miller. Did the miller who pulls her out of the water rob her jewels? And what should, and then toss her back in to die. That is all these, a lot of the versions go down side lines that take it away from the story. My version, this pleased me because all, it, against all logic, the drowning girl was pushed by her sister into the northern sea, it says. And then she floats along the seaside to a river, and then she floats up the river, how is this happening, and then down a mill race, and then the miller shows up. And I, many versions preserve this impossibility, and I found it so <laughs> offensive. And only yesterday I thought, well, maybe it was a tidal estuary, and she could have been pushed up by the tide. But that's coming late in my career here for me to have that bright thought. But when I was young, I just, I just thought this was all wrong. Okay. Here's a woo, very sentimental art again. In the oldest forms, this ballad was filled with intrigue and magic, was always warning of the dangers of envy. 
And in other ballads of watery murder, like the Banks of the Ohio or the Knoxville Girl, the aggressor always seems to want to stand around and watch as the victim drowns. And I think that's a nasty touch. But it reveals how well ballads illuminate the sort of shabbiness of evil on the era of the ballad. Yeah. But that it's shabby, this kind of, these kind of acts that ballads sort of point out as being the, the bad guy. Uh, some versions specifically stress the dangers of jealousy, and some have a more general take on human wickedness, and some emphasize the supernatural elements. And in Norman's ballad, I think those are still strongly held. <coughs> Though jealousy consumes the older sister, I'd say that she's treated badly. Quite a match. The man has come to court her, and in those days, that's an arranged marriage. Already arranged, he wouldn't have showed up. He's giving her a, a lo lovely gifts, and that includes a ring. And then, as now, a ring symbolizes deep love and honorable intentions. Especially if you gave a ring and a glove, which in many versions of this ballad they do, a ring and a glove are tokens of a binding engagement that was a promise to marry. And so why does he think he can make sheep's eyes at the younger sister? He's broken a serious vow, and my mother would say, a cad. He's a cad. But he is, and for some reason, pitied always in these songs. OK, so this creepy picture is chosen by Alfred Lord Tennyson in his poems for the, uh, his take on this ballad. And in that, he has the older sister woos, and she murders the man who has seduced and ruined her younger sister. She takes it. In, in a revenge way, and I, I think that that's more my take on this, too. And it's a kind of cool poem, 1833. Okay, but we got that, got to get back to this girl who was pushed into the water. She floats down, and the miller pulls her out of the water, sometimes dead, sometimes alive. In Scandinavia, they have 125 versions of this song, or more, and in every single one of them, practically, the girl is fished out alive and is allowed to live. And in the British Isles, and in America, she's always dead. <laughs> we, she's just not allowed to get away with anything. So the wandering musician who, in the ballad, comes and takes her bones, and there he is. He's found her, found her dead, and that's also from one of the, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know who did it, but it's got an initial. Anyway, he takes, she makes it, he makes an instrument that allows the girl to speak beyond death using her bones. So that harks back to the Viking idea of, of the bones being the, where the soul resides. And this category of folk tale is called the singing bone after a grim fairy tale that's very grim about men that are involved in this sort of war against each other. And the one's bones then sings and accuses his brother of having killed him. So a remarkable feature of these long-surviving ancient ballads is a pervasive and uneasy sense of mystery. And strange moments <coughs> remain in the song despite hundreds of years of revision and pious influences. And there's often some hint of some forgotten rit ritual or some supernatural perception that's just ruffling the surface of the ballad a little mm. bit. I told somebody it was like a Vermont lawn that looks all smooth and green, but rocks keep kind of coming to the surface. Mm -hmm. And those rocks are the, are the pagan belief systems that mm -hmm. are in these ballads in little odd ways. One of my uneasiest moments in this ballad arrives with the wandering musician. Here he is. And he has a shamanistic skill for making the dead bones speak. And that's a concept that's far older than any harp or fiddle. It's described by the controversial social anthropologist and ballad collector Barry Phillips, and he called it a resuscitation ritual, that the bones are harvested and they're revived by some sort of magical acts, and then they're made to speak, to give warnings or to dispense knowledge, or in this case, to accuse wrongdoers. Mm -hmm. And rituals like that are really, really ancient. Here is a painting from Tibet of two shin bone horns. They're leg bones, yeah, leg bone flutes. Oh. And if you use bones or hair or body parts, they're soul summoning rituals, they're called. And they still survive today in many shamanistic cultures. Here's a, uh, a another shin bone, that's a Tibetan shin bone horn. And thigh bone horns are used in a lot of very specific Tibetan rituals. 
but they, and I don't know if they're used to awaken some deceased sage who's good. The Dalai Lama's oracle enters into a trance and then he speaks and gives them advice and everyone's, they're madly honking these horns while he's going into a trance. That puts him into the trance. But they don't admit that they're using these horns. But it would make sense that, that if that's what you do to make magic and to bring the, the voice of somebody else forward. And um, I don't know when the Tibetans aren't saying, as far as I can tell. Okay, to a small degree, a remnant of this spirit something persists in our own culture. This is a reliquary foot. It holds, allegedly, the foot bones of a child killed by a little boy killed by King Herod. And it's inside this fancy foot, which was made in 1450, and inside there's an older reliquary that dates from way, way back. Worshipping before reliquaries that contain some saintly body part is done with the hope that you're going to be guided by the wisdom of that particular saint. Modern church, the, the modern church, the church, <laughs> disavows the idea that relics possess mystic powers. But that's a very recent assertion. For millions, these remain objects of that inspire a kind of deep mysticism, and they're believed to be imbued with enormous power to help and to guide. They're also very fancy. Uh, I like this one. It's the arm of St. Blaise, but we just I, this is just his hand. I liked it because in Norman's ballad, she, the girl has so many rings on that you can't see her fingers. And I didn't, I didn't draw it that way. I just gave her a couple of rings. So I, I, I put, that must be wrong. But here's this medieval thing, and that's what they did. <laughs> and how did they move their hands? I guess it's a way of saying, someone's going to wait on me. You know, I don't have to. Like Isha, fingernails, right? Somebody's going to do the work because you can't do a thing. Then you have know, fingernails that for that long. So in the ballad, Here's a horrible picture, um, but it, this is a ghost. I shouldn't say horrible, maybe you like it a lot. This is a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the harper, and he's making with whatever he's doing, he's getting ready to do a shamanistic act. But in the heart, he, at the water side, he takes these little bones and he fashions a musical instrument out of them, saying it's her breastbone and her finger bones are used to make this. Since the average Human sternum, sternum is about six inches long. It's got to be a very diminutive little instrument. Unless he's used the sternum for inlay on the wooden harp like I've done in the Craigie. But many instruments have been made using human bone in this way. Next, please. And I don't know what the musical result is. I, this is one's in the Met, and that's human bones in a Hardanger fiddle from 1786 in Norway, mm -hmm. and they don't, I don't think they, I don't know if they let you hear that be played. It might make people do strange things and speak <laughs> to the dead, but it's kind of gorgeous, and maybe it was honoring somebody that had died that they liked, but um, originally the uncanny instrument immortalized in this song was a harp. This is a Pictish carving of a harp player, and harps and lyres have been shown in in early or Iron Age stone carvings in northern British Isles dating from 2300 BC. That's really too long ago to even contemplate. But eventually, in many versions of the ballad, a fiddle replaces the harp as the instrument that allows the girl to speak from beyond death. Mm. And fiddles were invented in Italy around the mid 1500s. Mm. And they took a while to get to England. By 1700, this guy is not the guy. It was Martin Martin, who I don't know what he looks like. His, but this is a famous fiddler from Scotland. He wrote that uh, Martin Martin wrote a description of the Western Isles of Scotland. It's the oldest known account of the Hebrides. That, me, did he, that man's name. His name was James Scott Skinner. My granddad oh. knew him. You knew him. Yep, I, I know history. You're a, you're a marvel. That's great. <laughs> well, you don't know this. Oh, next guy, I bet. Yeah, he's he's fiddling. But um, anyway, the author of the story of the tour of the Hebrides said that he knew 18 fiddle players on the Isle of Lewis alone, mm -hmm. they, and that's Trump's mother's homeland. So, but that was in 1700. He wrote that, and so they were already playing fiddles. And so I thought, oh, that's going to help date this ballad when it changed over to fiddles. You know, that had to be after, you know after that presumed date of around 17. 1700. And uh, I was really pleased, but if you think like that, you might be mistaken. There were numerous medieval stringed instruments played with a bow. They were said to be introduced by returning crusaders who brought them back. And 
fiddle was the general name for all of them. Okay, this is one that has three little tuning pegs up there. And so it's a, it's a fiddle of sorts, but it's not our fiddle. And so I, all of these fiddles in, in those countries predated the violin. So the ballad might be referring to any number of bowed instruments, and it's no help at all in making a date. In addition to music and instruments, there are so many human aspects that are expressed in this ballad with the steady force of the river as backdrop. And I was so impressed by this sense of that river that I painted the entire scroll with a river running through it. And I grew to regret it as the scroll got longer and longer. <laughs> and I thought, why did I make this river blue as I'm running out of blue paint? Rivers aren't really blue except on really nice days. I could have made it all brown and it would have been so much easier. But I painted and painted and painted this river. And that stream, I'll let this carry me a moment, so I'll tell you now, being carried by this stream, who I am and why I'm here to show you a cranky while Norman sings it. And I've spent my whole life trying to figure out how one can best tell a story. So for me, a cranky skull is just another pleasant float down my personal river. And crankies were a term invented by Peter Schumann of Bread and Puppet. And they're small pre-industrial theaters in which a story is told by rolling past, by a scroll rolling past a viewing window. And they could be tiny, like this, that's a little handheld cranky of the Boer War, and you turn these little teensy knobs up at the top, and uh, and you get to see the Boer War. How exciting is that? And, um, and that they can be huge. That's a that's huge. And it, you would go to the movie theater to see this, and they would roll out this. You'd go on a whaling voyage, and when it was over, you'd leave the theater, and then it would go the other way because nobody wanted to rewind it. My favorite was the going down the Nile and down the Mississippi, where you go down the Nile and the next crowd comes in, they go up the Mississippi. <laughs> and uh, related visual devices have been used all over the world for centuries. And China, I think, has the earliest surviving documents of that, of evidence of that sort. Anyway, no matter what path I follow, narratives come out of it. As I paint, and that's how I paint, I make a big mess. I, was, uh, I'm, I have to admit, an untrained painter, and I'm uh, but I'm thinking, I start with the abstract painting and then I see a little something there that looks like a little face and oh dear, it becomes a story. So that's what happens. Narratives just pop out everywhere. And I also make play whistles. And here's one that always makes me laugh, and that's St. Francis preaching to the banjos. <laughs> and that's a craft I learned from my mother. Who I, and I often sing these old songs in the ballads I love as a child while I'm working. And I visualize them as the verses unwind. But since no little whistle can carry the whole story, I became interested in painting these long scrolls. And I've grown fascinated with each ballad's really rich and complex history. And everything, off-kilter paintings and books and old songs and everything has been a risk for the middle in my long life. And as I age, the landscape of my creative world changes. And all these streams of my interests have come to flow together in a way that really has surprised and pleased me. And so these lifelong streams of interest flowing all into each other. And here I am. Did this ballad affect me? Yes. Because here I am, I'm following the advice of the harper in the ballad. I've gone to visit the bones of Francis James Child, the ballad collector. Mm -hmm. And that he's down there in the, in the um, <laughs> Sedgwick Pie in Stockton, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So in the round, so that in, when the final trump is called, the Sedgwick will all sit up and they'll all not have to look at anyone but each other. Mm -hmm. And so they're planted in a circle like that. Mm -hmm. Sit up, see, see the people you care about. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. We had a nice chat. I brought him some whistles to discuss, and that is a very old Celtic harp. And now Norman has a few words to say as well, and then we're going to have the cranky. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, that what you are talking about is that a look at us. Yeah. My folks' history, of course. Yeah, I reckon that, I mean, I was raised amongst big the stones and things like that. And next month, if the creek don't rise, I'll be amongst big the stones again. The stuff that you brought up, just amazing. You know, this glove and ring, of course, uh, mm -hmm. 
well up where, where, where the glove and then the rings on top of that. Yes. To show the look on in there. Here, oh, well, now you're a very interesting I'm, I'm blue. Being, I'm being <laughs> Ultraviolet. <laughs> anyway, so they would put on the glove and then have oh, the ring on course, top. Of course, of course, of course. Now, the ballads on the whole were not sung by, they would be sung to wealthy people. They didn't sing it, nor uh, it was, regarded as common. Yeah. But like in most countries, the, the working class is by far the biggest class still yet in Britain. They may not think they are, but they are. In my day, working class was by the biggest and very, very different, different politics from the, the middle class who were trying to be upper class. And I was told, just sing that down dull stuff for it. Sing something modern, you know, that I like the stories. And I heard, I learned them. Some of them from street singers, the last of the street singers, you know, and I took them. And I was listening, when I was about 13, I was at a school near in Aberdeen, there was a Friday market, and there was a fellow there, he was a tinker. <coughs> and the tinker folk kicked a lot of this stuff going. But I went to school with tinkers. They, they, I mean, I'm talking, this is not my natural way of talking. If I talk the dialect that I learned from my grandma, I mean, even my father couldn't understand who we were speaking, because she was, she was for the country, and I was born in her bay. It was the first class, so she took me over. My mother did. I could speak to her, and my father would say, I wish the hell you two would speak, so I could understand. We talk way, 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 two, three hundred years older, which is natural to me. But the ballads, they didn't need to be translated to me at all. Mm -hmm. That was, so I just talked to them. Mm -hmm. My grandmother used to say, Luddy, you're a sponge for our knowledge. <laughs> and it was quite true. And they thought I was just weird. <laughs> could you never sing some, could you speak, speak French? I mean, I was strapped in school for saying one word in Scotch. Mm. A lot was tickling me. And the teacher says, what are you doing? Kennedy, sit still. I says, he's kettling me. What kick come with here? I was about 11, I got four in the strap. She said, the word is tickle. Mm. Oh. In 1870, it came up from London, the education place, that the Scottish dialects and the Gaelic language should be suppressed. Mm -hmm. and, and then the Irish too, and the Welsh. Suppressed, it was vicious, you know. Mm. Same, I've, I've got a Navajo name. Navajo mm. fellow would say that to me. He says, white people did that to other white people. They did it to me. Mm -hmm. First day of school there, taken away from his folks, his hair cut and deloused, and he needed to go to the toilet, he needed to pee, and he had to ask a girl in Navajo. Mm -hmm. And the teacher mm -hmm. says, what did he say? He wants to pee. Oh, I'll show him. He grabbed him, took him to the toilet, and put his head down the toilet and flushed oh, it. No. Did that four times. He says, I, I saw that to myself. That happened to you? I said, yep. Poor folk put down upon me by the ones above yeah. But still, you know, there's no be at home now in Scotland could sing that ballad like I read. And I've got it in Gaelic too. And I use them things when I'm doing walkings, when I'm shrinking cloth. Next month there's two pieces of cloth waiting for me up in, in, uh, in Minnesota. And my poor paws, you know, last Wednesday was my 86th birthday. And I came a bit worn out. But I lived in the house across the road for about eight, nine years. And that who's heard me singing ballads when I was walking back and forth, because folks sang. They were doing repentant work, hard work, and to keep their mind up, or else to sing together. You know, um, Molly, ba Molly Bond, mm -hmm. Molly Bond, there are 15 versions in the collective in Aberdeen from different villages. So one time I was up. I was a collector of taxes for years, civil servant. I was looking for this fella. He's away to see a young lad who was a lot of money. So they said, no, but he, his wife's working in there. The herring boats are coming in. And I walked into this place, and there were 80 or 90 people, grandmas, mothers, and granddaughters. All of them with muscles. All who were women and folk come with muscles, because they work physical hard work. So I never used to annoy my mother, because she would knock me down, you know, literally. Anyway, so she only did it once or twice, and I learned to watch what I was saying. But anyway, so I went down there, and there was all the singing, 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 14 hours in that feet, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the boats were coming in, heron boats, 
had us all going there. But anyway, we, they were singing, we all live in the <laughs> and they stopped that and an old woman started singing Bobby Allen. They, to, to hear that many women who just naturally knew these, they were just songs. Just to me, it was just songs, you know. But I really like the old ones with stories, especially to do with places and people, clans and that, that I knew. The ballads at some of the castles people still live in them. So this Benori or Benori. Um, they sung it in Montrose, which is for their sins, the thinkers. The thinkers that came there, because they were regarded as low class, and they were out camping in the <coughs> you know. But the woman I got it from, Jeannie Roberts, and she eventually got a silver medal from the Queen's in Han, well, uh, because what she did for our culture. Well, we were born to the Noir, and we were put in from the Granite Kings, and here she was across, pardon me, across the road, and her, her mother. Her mother was a great singer, Mariah, but by that time she'd taken a stroke. Mm. Last time I saw Jeannie, it was been living here. I was brought into this country to represent Scotland for that, for the singing. Mike Seeger, he heard me at home, and then I was 65, and then 66, I decided I would leave a lot of stuff there. That's our opportunity here. I would never get in that little country. In fact, I appreciated it even more. It was so foreign. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, last time I saw Jeannie, she took a stroke, and she was trying to pour it and she was knocking over the cup, and she said to me, Norman, sing me in a man's songs. Mm. Sing me one of my own songs. I mm. the hardest thing I'd ever to do, to sing a song that I learned from that woman, and she could never sing it again, you know, mm. but I've got it in my head, you see. Damn few you now in Scotland. And then I put the Gaelic version too. I use these things for walkings, for shrinking cloth, you know, for beating. Uh, next month, uh, they put two or three pieces in a new woven blanket and up in Minnesota for me to shrink. But then more people know about it here, that then across there, and more people have heard these ballads across here because of that work. So I've taught all those. So. You ready to hum? And I have to do it much slower than I'm used to, okay? No, you can do it your usual speed. Oh, mercy me, it'll be going around like this. It'll be close. Then <laughs> <laughs> you can slow down, no? Okay, we'll go in. Where's two sisters bed and a foot benori, oh benori, they're coming next. There be there wood for the bonny maldam so benori. He's courted the eldest but glove and ring. Benori, oh benori. But he's love at the youngest and be nothing. For the bonny maldam so benori. He's courted the eldest but glove and knife. Benori, oh Benori, but he's love at the youngest mare nor his life, by the bonny maldams of oh, Benori. It was upon a morning clear, Benori, oh Benori, she cries unto her sister dear, by the bonny maldams of oh, Benori. Sister, sister, come tap my bed the hand, Benori, oh Benori. And we'll walk down by the water strand, by the bonny maldams, oh Benori. The youngest, she stood upon a steam, Benori, oh Benori. The elder should come and she shoved her in to the bonny meldams of Benori. Sometimes she sunk, sometimes she swam. Benori, oh Benori, till she floated down to the mellers dam to the bonny meldams of Benori. Miller, Miller, come draw your dam, Benori, oh Benori, 
There's a in the ram, and we got a mel quite swan, and the bonny mel dams of glory. The melody hissed and drew his dam, Benori, oh Benori. And there he spun a drunic woman, with the bonny mel dams of Benori. You couldn't see her little wee feet. Benori, oh Benori, her golden fringes they were so deep, but the bonny mel dams of Benori, you couldn't see her middle so small. Benori, oh Benori, her golden girdle little well so bra, but the bonny mel dams of Benori, you when I see her fingers so small, Benori, oh Benori, with diamond rings they were covered up with the bonny mel dams of Benori. And I'm on her yellow hair, Benori, oh Benori, a rope or pearls was Twine it fair with the bonny mal dams of Benori. By and come a harp of fine Benori, oh Benori. A harp it for the king to die with the bonny mal dams of Benori. He's made a harp put in her breast vein. Benori, oh Benori. For soon would melt a hair to steam with the bonny mel dams of Benori. He's gain and take a feather's hull, Benori, oh Benori. And there was a court assembled up with the bonny mel dams of Benori. He's laying the heart down on a steam. Benori, oh Benori, and sign that begun to play had slain with the bonny mel dams of Benori. Yonner sits my feather the king, Benori, oh Benori, and yonner sits my mother the queen with the bonny mel dams of Benori. Yonner stands my brother Hugh, Benori, oh Benori, and be him my William sweet and true, with the bonny mel dams of Benori. But the last tune that the heart played then, Benori, oh Benori, was waste my sister false Helen, with the body mel dams of Benori. <laughs> <laughs> anyone wants to see anything, look at this. You're welcome to enroll it a little bit. And did you want to sing another song? Or not? <laughs> but I would just say something about the theme of all these songs is jealousy. There's one of long healing songs, and they sing beautiful, uh, an older woman, you know, yearning after a younger man, and he's saying, I'm trying to get lost. But anyway, there's an Irish version that too. But the first line says, Hikri Nihanganiri, and Chekal Chietos and Guru. Three things come without bidding mm. fear, jealousy, and love. Oh. And then she says, And it's no my, not my fault that I fell victim to one of them. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, whatever. So yeah. she fell in love with the homes I chose here. But <coughs> I'll send you something cheery. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And as I was a walking one morning in me, I spied a young couple a coming my way. And the one was a fair bed, and a beauty I declare. And the other, he was a soldier, and a bold grenadier. You can pick up the chorus as it goes. And they kissed so sweet and comforting as they clung to each other. They went arm in arm along the road like sister and brother. They went arm in arm along the road till they came to a stream. And the boat sat down together, loved to hear the nightingale sing. Kind kisses and compliments as they both did walk together. Till they did come down by the side of some river. Where they did sit down with boys by the side of some stream. Hark, hark, cries the fair maid, how the nightingales sing. And they kissed so sweet and comforting as they clung to each other. They went arm in arm along the road like sister and brother. They went arm in arm along the road till they came to a stream. And they both sat down together, love to hear the nightingale sing. Well, out of his knapsack, he drew a fine fiddle, and he played her such a tune, me boys, that the valleys did ring. He played her such a tune, me boys, that the valleys did ring. Hark, hark, cries the fair maid, how the nightingales sing. And they kissed so sweet and comforting as they clung to each other. They went arm and arm along the road like sister and brother. They went arm and arm along the road till they came to a stream. And they both sat down together, loved to hear the nightingale sing. Well, now cries the soldier. It is time to give o'er. Oh no, cried the fair maid, we will have one tune more. For I do like the tunes you play and the touch of your string. Hark, hark, cries the fair maid, how the nightingales sing. And the kisses are sweet and comforting as they clung to each other. They went arm and arm along the road like sister and brother. They went arm and arm along the road till they came to a stream. And they both sat down together to hear the nightingale sing. It is now for the alehouse we're bound for to steer. Where we will drink wine, my boys, instead of small beer. And if ever I do return again, it'll be early in the spring. And we'll watch the pretty flowers blow and hear the nightingale sing. And the kisses so sweet and comforting as they clung to each other. They went arm and arm along the road like sister and brother. They went arm and arm along the road till they came to a stream. And they both sat down together love to hear the night in hills. Oh, you fast limbs. <laughs> Any questions about any of this old fashioned stuff? <laughs> yeah, if anybody has any questions? No, it's, it's Shakespeare would have known that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the Norse. Of course, the, the Norse for about 400 years ruled all the outer heavies. In my area, Danish. So it's Danish uh, DNA in my blood. Yeah. 16%. And then further north, it was the Norwegians. And then Shetland and Orkney, and then all the Hebrides. And about 1411, there was a manish 
Kui see on, et ta reinsi mõnusi, siis on see lahti nüüd mõtla. Ja see on lahti nüüd lahti mõtlas. But anyway, it was a princess up in Lachlan, in Norway, Lachlan, you call it. And getting married onto a high-born Scottish Hebridean lad. He didn't get to speak. But anyway, and they were very powerful, the Hebridean chiefs, you know. Because the McDonald's, the two McDonald's, McDonald's and the Moyt mainland, McDonald's out there, and they were the lord of the Isles, you know. They called them that. Oh, they were high food. The biggest clan. Snooty, too. But anyway, whatever. But the Norwegians had been fighting with the Swedes. I mean, even yet in Minnesota. You get two parts of a log, like Swedish milk or some worthwhile drinking, you know. I heard that one time. Are you joking? You've been at that thing before for hundreds of years. But anyway. The, the Norwegians couldn't have come up with the dowry, so they put the Orkneys, the Shetlands, and all the Hebrides in pawn. Mm -hmm. And up to 1411, they couldn't saw that the, the Scottish king said, we're keeping it. But there were so many uh, Norse going down there, and they got all with the folk fine, you know, but they interbred. So Trump's mother, she's, uh, I think she's from McLeod, let's see. She's from Paris to all. She pure. She no English until she went to school, of course. Mm. And she, you know, she'd spun and carded and woven. Nobody would have asked her. And gone barefooted to the to the mosque with the creel on her back to, to get from. She come from poor, poor people. But I heard that her sister came across like all the old people did. They sent one, mm. and they would work like hell and bring another one. You know. Mm -hmm. So when she was brought she across to New York, she got a, a job as being a skiffy. In, the, the, in Trump's grandfather's house, and of course they were pure German, they were from Austria. So uh, Trump's father was raised in a German-speaking home, and he, the, one of the lads took up with her, you see. So Trump's father spoke German, and his mother took pure Lewis Gaelic, you know, very, very uh, Presbyterian. And you won't go no dancing, no drinking, and things like that, singing these eternal long psalms. And then, uh, so I don't think he knows any of that stuff of his own people. But mm -hmm. he's got Norse blood in him too. So them Norse folk, they sure got around. <laughs> and the Isle of Lewis is the place where they lock the swing sets on, on Sundays oh, yeah. so children couldn't swing mm -hmm. on the Sabbath. <laughs> and then they, they built a bridge across the. the <laughs> to, to, I've been across it two years ago to the Isle of Sky, and then the first uh, Sunday, they, had, they thought, Oh, this is great, we'll go for a drive up the sky. And here were ministers lying. They lay on the road to stop them. Mm -hmm. And then the next Sunday, some people went across, because there were golf courses. They went to play golf on the Sabbath, land the Sabbath. Oh. Oh, they got around, you know. The, the newer generation, but I remember that time. So that's how his marking. Yep. Did you say how this collaboration came to be? And this, I gave a cranky, just a cranky shoulder. Not, what was it? Not even down to the wife of Russia's well, I don't remember what it was. Um, at a Thanksgiving dinner, and he was there, and he said, I know, I've seen Alex, I've seen Alex, this is He had some ideas for ballads that would be good, and then when they asked me if I would do a Frankie show, I said, yes, but I want Norman to sing, because... Well, there's the one you wanted me to sing, but I had only four or five verses. Lord Bacon. Oh, Lord Bacon, oh, Lord it was the only ballad with a happy ending. I felt that could be uplifting. <laughs> Dita, would you sing one verse of one ballad that's in, uh, one other ballad? Yeah, for us. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, I want boo. <laughs> I'll sing an American one so you can. Yeah. Ooh, like our pretty Polly, the whole will live long night. Poor pretty Polly, the whole live on night. I left her next morning before it was light. That's one verse. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Kurasad end in two, isn't it? Hmm? That's yeah. Kurasad end in two. Of course. <laughs> she goes off with a man she hardly knows, then it comes to a bad end. Because I love it, you know, <laughs> the, the guys get them knocked up, and then they don't. Yep. Get, you know, they cut that out of the out of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that, they, that's what happened in the old song. Because mm -hmm. people said, was well, he just a psycho psychopathic killer? And I thought, yeah. well, no, he had his reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but she was pregnant, and the, but that's been told. You know, all my wives? You know, all my wives? Doc Watson mm -hmm. just sing all my wives? That's two sides of the same. Well, no. No. But it was the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing, yeah. There are a lot of murder ballads, but the queen oh. of murder ballads is pretty poly. Oh. Yeah. She is the queen. Hey, I have one other question, Dee Dee. Uh, is there, could you tell me if the uh, bone instruments from Tibet predate or postdate the Mongol invasion? I don't know. I, don't know I could you tell you that. something about that, though. Archaeology <laughs> is, is a, uh, uh, a deep interest to me, and still is, because I was, when we were young, when I was maybe 11, the war was still going on. Everybody had to go at the harvest for the, the potatoes, you know, because we get very little food. Mm. And we were digging tatties in the standing stone circles. Oh. And, and then the carved stones, the Pictish stones, were Pictish carved on one side and a cross on the other. Uh -huh. That's when it started coming. Oh, but you know about Neolithic people? Ancient, ancient, ancient people. They have found uh, remains, the ancient remains, and vulture bones uh -huh. were holes. So the uh, uh, oh, Neolithic flutes. people, yeah. They found oh, that quite yeah. recently. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So oh. the flutes oh. and ancient, oh. ancient, oh. ancient, oh. before oh. our people came along, you know? Huh. Cool. Yeah. Well, there's an answer to that question. I think there are refreshments for us, don't there? There are, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. as I do to have two legends in our museum tonight. Let's give them one more round.